Hi, welcome to Exploring Illusion of Free Will. My name is George Ortega, and I'm here via video with my co-host Chandler Klebs. He's going to do another 12-minute segment, and the title of this show is Free Will and Perfection. So basically, Chandler is going to like do a segment on why our not being perfect is yet another way of understanding why we don't have a free will. Again, this is episode number 184. Okay, so, um, all right, basically, before I introduce Chandler, um, what is free will? Free will is like if, if we could do things without our unconscious taking part in our decisions or actually making them completely for us, without our, our upbringing, what we've learned, how our parents raised us, you know, what we haven't learned, taking part in our decisions, without our genes taking part in our decisions. That's what free will means. Free will means that we can circumvent or overcome all those influences. And anybody who knows science or who understands logic knows that that's completely impossible. All right, but Chandler's going to explain this relative to perfection. And then I'm going to like come back. And since he's explained this so well, I think I'm going to get into, um, I'm going to do a commercial for a, a, what we're doing, the significance of it. All right. So, all right, take it away, Chandler, and we'll be back in about 12 minutes. Thanks a lot. Robot, unicorn, attack. Why did I say robot, unicorn, attack at the beginning of this video? If you're asking that question, well, that's good because you have to understand that everything has a cause. Surely there must be a cause for me saying Robot Unicorn Attack. And if you know about the game called Robot Unicorn Attack, well, then you're going to know the cause for why I said that. And if you don't, Google it. Seriously. You may notice that I'm wearing my glasses in this video. And why am I wearing my glasses? Because my vision is not perfect and neither is yours. And that's what this video is about. Perfection. Our concept of something being perfect or perfection, what does it mean? Because everybody has a different idea of what perfect is. And I think I know what, peop what people usually mean. When someone has an intention, a plan, a purpose, something that they are trying to do, and then they succeed exactly as they intended, they say that it was perfect. We talk about drawing a perfect circle, um, you know, a, a perfect shape, a perfect number, a perfect color. But perfect always has a context. It always has a different meaning. And you know what? Look into people's idea of perfect. Uh, you know, perfect, perfection. Um, sometimes they call it something being complete, whole, pure, whatever. Whatever your definition of perfection is. I'm here to tell you the problem with perfection is that we are not able to always do as we intend. And this is a very good way of explaining why we don't have a free will. Think about it. No matter what your idea of perfect is, would if you had a free will, wouldn't you be able to be perfect? Wouldn't you be able to play that song on the piano perfectly? Wouldn't you be able to play a video game perfectly? Wouldn't you be able to say the, the right thing all the time? I mean, seriously, perfection. What is perfect? This is a big philosophical thing, man. But anyway, perfection, depending on your definition, I suppose, may or may not exist. But I, I 
here's the way I look at it. First of all, we know that everything has a cause. Ruling out free will right there. Because you you do what you do because there's a cause for it. And there's a cause for that. And the cause of regression goes back to before you exist. Before your parents had sex. All of that stuff. Um, and indeterminism, uh, also known as randomness or a causality, well, that ruins free will. Just because if something's random, if, it's ha if it has no cause, or at least um, you call it random because you don't know the cause or it's unpredictable or whatever, well, you can't be responsible for it. You can't take credit or blame for a, a random event either, in any sense of random, really. Um, and understanding that we have an un unconscious mind um, and that our body functions are not under our conscious control helps us further understand why we don't have a free will. Um, because we, our conscious mind um, receives from the unconscious information and thinks that it chose something when really it was processed by the unconscious, but still entirely causal process. Um, so here's the deal. These three things, determinism, indeterminism, and the unconscious mind, all refute free will um, in so many ways. But perfection. This is what I would call maybe a fourth way. We are not even able to as we do as we intend all the time. Seriously, we, we know we want to say something, but we just can't get it out. And we make mistakes when we're saying stuff. And this is something that, you know, if you, even if you know nothing about determinism, indeterminism, or the unconscious, because you haven't read any philosophy or psychology or any of that, people become frustrated. Perfectionism is dangerous, man, because people, they're trying to do something and they think that they have self-control. They think they have a free will. They think that they can make themselves do what they want to do. And even if they were able to, that wouldn't necessarily mean that they had a free will because it, there's, I mean, your desires are also not your choice. You know, the, all the prior causes, um, whether deterministic or even a-causal, would still not be your choice. The unconscious is not, not your choice, because you, you're not conscious of it by definition. But seriously, moving all aside from that, we're not able to do as we want. Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever noticed you're just not able to do what you want to do? You totally want to do something. You're trying to beat a level in a video game. You're trying to write a book. You're, you're trying to tell someone something. You're tr and, you know, you're trying to communicate with, with, with somebody about something, and it just goes wrong. Seriously. Because we've nev we can never attain perfection or perfect um, in the sense of being able to do what we want, you know, because that's it. Like... You know, if you if you, you see a circle, we know what a circle is. If you try to draw a circle and it looks like a circle, well, you say it's a perfect circle. If it looks like a triangle, dude, that's wrong. Now, if you were trying to draw a triangle and it looked like a circle, that's also wrong. So a lot of the time, we just simply mean perfect as we were able to do what we wanted to do. You know, and so, you know, you might talk about, you know, like... A perfect straight line but anyway enough of geometry stuff I'm very geometrical like that but anyway the point is we never attain the type of perfection whether that's per perfection of knowledge knowing everything we don't know the truth about everything how things really work because the past is infinite and the future is infinite um, and you know, we can't be morally perfect in the sense of always doing the good thing, um, always doing the right thing that makes people happy, because happiness is really what morality is about. Um, but anyway, the point is, 
We're not able to do that. Why are we not able to do that? Think about it. Think really deep about why aren't we able to be perfect? Why aren't we all able to do as we intend to do? And if you meditate on that, you might start understanding that free will is an illusion. Like seriously, because if there is anything at all, at any time, that is not in our control, making us do something, making us choose something well it's not perfection you know what I'm, it's not it's not like it's not like the choice you made was completely up to you and that's the thing is but you have to understand like um let's say that your house is on fire and and you let's say you have a front door and a back door or let's say that there's multiple ways out of the house or let's say you're in a burning building and there's all sorts of different uh, exits well let you, okay in that moment you have to choose um which way to go out before you get burned to death think about that now anybody with in, any intelligence is going to go out the shortest possible way. The quickest, fastest way is the way to get out of a burning building. I think most of us know that. Um, but here's the point. It's not a perfect situation to be in. It's not ideal to have your house or an office building burning. So it wasn't your choice for the building to be burning. And it forced you, it compelled you to escape the burning building. Why? Because burning hurts. And you don't want to feel pain. And because we all seek pleasure and avoid pain, that right there shows how impossible free will is. Or even the concept of, of making any choice at all, like seriously. But that's the thing, is that for things to be perfect now would probably mean that everything in the past had to be perfect also. Seriously. How does that work? And we have concepts of perfection that we're taught that this is perfect. And we have concepts of better or worse, you know, good, better, best, and sometimes just really bad. Um, well, here's the deal. Here's, here's, here's another interesting thing. Which is the perfect gender, male or female? Which is the perfect gender, seriously? Or even just say, which is the best gender? By what standard? Seriously, we wouldn't exist if there wasn't like opposite gendered parents having sex in the first place. So, I don't know, man. But, like, think about that. Just think about how, what an illusion perfection is. Okay, thank you, Chandler. Chandler, our new co-host, he's doing a great job. He's, you know, he's, um, this is, I think, his sixth episode here. He's uploading videos to Internet Archive. I mean, like, think about Chandler. He's got a keen intellect, but that's not all. You know, Chandler is a very compassionate person. Okay, he cares about people. He cares about not just people, about animals, about life in general. So, like, it's good to have somebody with, with a keen intellect who's also very compassionate, very, a very good person pioneering this cause. Okay, and I want, that's what I want to talk about now, because with Chandler and I and my co-host, uh, my former co-host of this show, my co-host, and he's also the producer of our Manhattan show, Nick Vale, and our other co-host of the Manhattan show, Mike Laster are doing, and several other colleagues that I've worked with over the years. What we're basically doing is leading the world to a categorically new consciousness. And so like you might ask yourself, well, how big is this? You know, what does this mean relative to, let's say, other kinds of achievements in the world? All right. Back in 2005, this British psychologist, Susan Blackmore, published a book called Conversations on Consciousness. 
I think what the best minds think about free will, something, whatever. It's got like a long subtitle. But anyway, in that book, for that book, he interviewed John Searle, who is an American philosopher, and he's pretty eminent in his field. Uh, you can't say much about the field because, like, you know, more philosophers believe in free will than don't. But nonetheless, you know, like, he's ranked, like, among philosophers that were born after 1900, he's ranked number 12th, 13th, 14th in this, like, in terms of like how many times he's been cited in this um, encyclopedia of philosophy. Somebody did a survey, so like, you know. So anyway, like, so Susan Blackmore asks him, all right, you know, and incidentally, John Searle believes, he, he's not, he's a bit agnostic, but he leans toward the belief in free will. So this isn't kind of like a self-serving statement that he's making. So like, um, Blackmore asks him, you know, well, if the world would come to understand and accept that free will is an illusion, what would that mean? And Searle's response was, and I'll quote it, because you know, I use it as actually the, the beginning of the show, of, you know, done shows about this. He, he, be, he said that, quote, that would be a bigger revolution in our thinking than Einstein or Copernicus or Galileo or Newton or Darwin. It would alter our whole conception of our relation with the universe, end quote. Okay, that's how big this is. You know, that's how big this is like, you know, there have been different revolutions in the past. Like, you know, we discovered the unconscious. That was kind of big. Um, just like the world um, is not 6,000 years old. It's, you know, like, you know, our universe, our known universe is 14, about 14 billion years old. There's different revolutions. Darwin, you know, evolution, okay? The fact that, like, no, we, the first woman was not yanked out of the, the rib of the first man, and the first man wasn't made out of a lump of clay. You know, we evolved over millions of years from other life forms, okay? These have been scientific revolutions in human thought. But according to Searle, and, you know, he uses these, like, these top names for a reason. He's basically citing them because, like, this, this revolution in, in human thinking is greater than what has happened in the past, okay? Now, I can think of, like, a, human, a revolution in human thinking that would be even greater, but it hasn't... I mean, like, it's on the way it's happening, but who knows how long it's going to take. It's, in other words, like, if somebody could come up with a way... Again, it's happening to, like to make everyone completely happy on the planet, because again, we're, we're biologically hardwired to seek pleasure and avoid pain, you know, happiness is really all there is, that would be a bigger achievement. Uh, if, if someone would come up with some way to make everyone really good, that I think would be a greater achievement, because like, goodness, you know, according to John Locke, this British philosopher is actually what creates happiness. You know, that's, that's his definition. All right, but these things haven't happened. If, if somebody discovers what happens after we die, that might be a, a, a bigger revolution in our thought. If somebody like, if we like, were able to communicate with aliens, you know, who live who knows where, you know, some other part of the um, universe or galaxy, whatever, that might be a bigger revolution in our thinking. But these things have not happened. All right, so like... So, and, and the reason I say that Chandler and, and Nick and Mike and myself and a few other people are leading this revolution is because we are. You know, like this, again, this is our 180th, 80, what is it, 184th episode. We've been doing this for like over four years. My meetup in, in Manhattan has been going on for four years. Nick's show in, in Manhattan in New York City has been going on for over three years. Um, we've published books on it. Basically, before we started doing this work, you know, which, which basically began in around 2010, this issue was, it just languished in academia. You know, like, you know, e even, though, even though it's the most written about, talked about apparently, you know, according to the philosophers, um, issue or topic in philosophy, you never hear about it. People don't hear about it. So, right. so what happened was, like, I decided, like, you know, back in 2010, I decided I'm going to move this issue from academia to the mainstream. You know, just get it out there because, like, the academians, again, they're kind of clueless. They, you know, you'd have to conclude that they got their PhDs not because they know how to think, not because of the, their critical analysis skills, but because they're good at memorizing facts and then, you know, <laughs> retrieving the information for tests. You know, that's the only way you can explain how a person can get a PhD and not understand that free will is impossible. 
So anyway, so the issue of free will just languished in academia because they don't even get the relevance, the significance. Searle gets this. Searle gets this. But most philosophers, I mean, I've read a lot of philosophers' works on this. They, they will talk in a very dry, you know, humdrum manner about why we may have free will, why we may not, whatever. But they rarely, rarely talk about the significance. And, and the significance couldn't be more important. All right, so anyways, like... So what I decided to do, yeah, this is a commercial, all right. And Chandler, this is like, you know, Chandler, um, this, isn't, this isn't done yet. I mean, we got the ball rolling. So now what we're doing is we're moving, it, um, we're, we're getting it done faster. So, so Chandler's taking part in this very historic undertaking. We are pioneering a new human consciousness, all right. And so like, basically... Um, basically I lost my train of thought. Um, and if I had a free will, I wouldn't. Um, so, all right. So basically, all right. All right so like, how did it, how did this happen back in 2010? Um, I wanted to create a buzz about this. I wanted to get people talking about it. I wanted to get, you know, because like in academia, you know, they'll write books about some, some of these academians, some of these philosophers have like thought about this topic for decades and they still get it wrong. Daniel Dennett is, is one of them. I mean, the guy's clueless. Sometimes like, it's not just cluelessness. It's like, it's intellectual um, dishonesty. He'll, 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 he'll claim he has a free will or we have a free will by redefining the term, you know, away from what, you know, the, the traditional debate has been about for centuries. But, um, but anyway, so like I wanted to create a buzz about our not having free will. So like I thought, all right, well, you know, if I create a meetup in Manhattan, fine, not many people will join the meetup, but there's a lot of people on meetup.com. There's a lot of meetups in Manhattan. A lot of people go to the site. You know, it's, it's a site for those of you don't, who don't know what it is. Like most of the stuff on the internet happens on the internet. This meetup.com is like you go to the internet to look for real events with real people happening in real places. All right. So like we have a, an event one, once a month. So like, all right, we don't get all that many people at our events. Like last month we had 15, which is kind of cool. But my, um, my prediction was like that by now, millions of people have seen that listing, Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. That's, that's what the meetup is called. Before that, it was called, um, what it was, I think I started out with like the Predetermined Will Society, Busting the Free Will Myth. That was the original name. And, you know, I think there was another name before that, whatever, or, or after that. But anyway, like, and like, now Manhattan, I, I live here in White Plains. I could have based it here in White Plains. But I based it in Manhattan and I have the meetup in Manhattan because like White Plains is about almost 60,000 people population, right? Manhattan has um, 1.5 million and a lot of people from New York City go to the meetups in Manhattan. And that's, that's like about 8 million. It's not just that. I mean, a lot of people in New Jersey, Connecticut, Westchester go to these meetups in Manhattan. So the whole tri-state area is about 22 million people. Okay. You know, fine. You know, a lot of them going on, well, you know, relatively whatever, um, people going on meetup.com and, and getting this, you know, like, and then, you know, so that, that was the beginning. It's like, I did this in 2010. I started that, that meetup in April. Then like between 2010 and 2012, all of a sudden you had three dozen major magazines and um, newspapers um, publishing off, often first, first time refutations of free will. Scientific American published a refutation of free will on its cover. New Scientist published the first ever cover story on why we don't have a free will. Okay. Then it was covered by the New York times. It was covered by time magazine. It was covered by psychology today. So basically, you know, about three dozen articles during those, you know, between 2010 and 2012. And not only that, I mean, the other thing I wanted to do, not just with the meetup, but with this show, with a couple of books I've written, I wanted to get other people writing about this. And that's what's happened. This guy, Sam Harris, he's a neuroscientist. In 2012, he wrote a book, Free Will, Refuting Free Will. And what's really cool, I'm getting into like what's going to be happening soon. There's this guy, John Gray, who's a psychologist who, I think he's very famous. A lot of people know him for a book he wrote 
decades ago, ago called Men Are From Mars, Women Are from, from Venus. He's basically explaining why men are different from women and why sometimes we can't understand them and they can't understand us and it causes problems. Anyways, like in May, he's coming out with a book called The Soul of the Marionette, if I got that correct. And what's cool about this book is like, all right, 100 and, over 180 episodes of us explaining in detail you know, why do we have, we don't have a free will, but, but John Gray in his book, it's going to be a novel. And sometimes this is great, because sometimes people need to not just understand something conceptually in a kind of like a nonfiction, you know, explanatory way. People relate well to narrative, to stories, you know, to fiction. So in other words, like in this novel, I think people are going to finally, you know, many more people I think after this novel are going to like understand why free will is impossible you know because because he's going to like you know I haven't read it you know hopefully I'll definitely read it when it comes out but I'm guessing he's going to like just he's going to like make the issue very personal he's going to like you know for example a kid you know doesn't get a, a good enough grade on um in a course in a class he's taking and the parents are angry with him well you know like if the parents understood that the kid didn't have free will fine, they might, you know, they might want to punish him or reward him for, you know, for having um, not good grades or good grades, but they would do it more compassionately because they'd understand that fundamentally, you know, whether the kid has the intelligence, the motivation, whatever it is, there are reasons for whether, you know, why he's doing well or not, and he doesn't have a free will. The, these reasons are not up to him. So, like, you know, basically, Gray, I think, in this book is going to, like, just, like, present this in a way that will we'll not just understand that appreciate it. Because the reason I'm doing this, the reason Chandler's doing this, the reason we're all doing this is we understand that it's not just the greatest thing ever, the greatest, you know, revolution in human thought. It, it can make this world so much better. Because when, when we stop blaming others and stop blaming ourselves for things that are not in our control in any way, we can be far more compassionate and understanding. We're not going to have as much conflict, as much vengeance and revenge. It's going to be a much, much more intelligent and, you know, wonderful world, society. All right, we got like 23 seconds left to go. And we're going to keep doing this until you get it. So, all right, thanks for watching, and we'll be back next week. Or, yeah, I'm not sure what, what our next episodes are about. I think I'm going to like finish up the series on the book that I wrote, and I might bring Chandler in, into this to help me do this. All right, thanks for watching, and we'll see you again soon on Exploring Illusion of Free Will. Thanks. Uh -huh.